uh, when you're doing environmental monitoring, uh, there's a few issues when you're, when you're looking at chemicals in the environment. You can look at them one by one using chemical methods, and we have more and more advanced chemical methods to do that now. Uh, but the problem is you miss this whole mixture uh, concept. You know, we're not exposed to, if you drink a glass of water, for example, you're not exposed to just a single chemical, you're exposed to a whole mixture of whatever chemical is in that water. If you look at them one by one, the things you see is only what you look for. Uh, with bioassays, this, this technique that we've sort of adopted from the pharmaceutical uh, industry, you use that effect, you, you're measuring the effect of those chemicals. So you're not looking at each one single, single-handedly, but you're looking at the whole mixture of them and what biological effect they can have. And that has a few very powerful um, consequences. First one is that you can look at mixture toxicity, you can look at mixture compounds, you can also look at transformation products, unexpected compounds that you don't necessarily set out to detect, to measure, but with those biomasses you're able to pick them up. So they're, they're a very um, useful additional tool for risk assessment, for example, which cannot, in the current model, deal with this issue of mixture toxicity or transformation products. There's two main reasons. The first one is a bit of a misunderstanding, and it's this conception that bioassays are, for some reason, very difficult, very complicated to carry out in the lab. And it, it's, it's just, it, I mean, it's, it's not easy. They're not simple methods. But when you're dealing with micropollutants, there is no such thing as a simple method. You know, our alternatives are LCHRMS or GCQ, which are very complicated on their own. So if you're dealing with micropollutants, you will need an advanced technique such as bioassays. It's not an easy technique, but it's not a much more complicated technique than some of the advanced uh, chemical techniques. On the other, one of the other main reasons they're not more used uh, currently in, in the wider world is because they're not used. They're not used in regulation. There's no guideline for a bioassay. And why do we test our water quality? Because there's a guideline. You know, we test uh, concentration of chemical X, Y, or Z because there's suddenly in the drinking water guideline of of our country there is a guideline for this compound. And so it's important for the water utility, the water suppliers, to test to make sure the water is compliant and safe. Um, and that's what we do with the testing of it. For bioassays, they've been very useful in a research environment. They haven't yet transitioned into a regulatory framework or a more you know, routine testing uh, strategy because there is no trigger level, there's no guideline. We don't really know if you test a water sample with a bioassay, you get a result. We don't really know yet whether is that result too high, too low? What does that mean for my water treatment plant? Does that mean I've got water that's toxic or not? Do I need to turn it off? Do I need to change something? And so until we've made that transition to provide a trigger level, I think they will remain relatively you know, research tool. It's, it's an issue that the scientific community dealing with these bioassay tools or bioanalytical tools has had to deal with for a few years. And it's now starting to show the progress of all that thinking. Um, and we're finding it starting to find ways to answer that. So there's, there's a few different methods, and I won't bore you with the technical detail of it, but there are a few different techniques that we can now apply to try to derive a trigger level. We want to keep calling it a trigger level rather than a guideline, because the biomasses are really useful as a screening, as a first tier. We don't, at this stage at the very least, but even in the foreseeable future, we don't want to have a guideline, you know, a standard based on bioassays. The idea is more to develop those trigger levels that allow you to go, okay, well, I'm, first thing I'm going to test my water sample with this new biomass, with this biomass, and I will compare the result that I get with this trigger level. If it's below the trigger level, fine, my water is clean, my water is safe, I don't need to do anything. If it's above the trigger level, then it's not, my water is not safe, it's I need to find out what's causing this biomass. And so deriving those trigger levels is, is the game uh, at the moment. And there, there, like I said, there's a few papers that have come out in the last six months to a year that start to address this question. We really need to start looking at them. They're different methods. They propose different ways of doing things. Surely some of them are better than others. So we just need to get our head around this question and find out which method do we want to use. Can it be applied to all bioassays equally? Do we need one method for one another? But we're, we're getting there. I think we're starting to get some of the answers to that. And once we do, then it will, we'll be able to make the link with the regulators. We really need to make sure that we communicate clearly to the regulators what these bioassay tools can, but more importantly, cannot do. Regulators have a problem and they know it. And in Australia, they've been really good at starting to 
get their heads around it. The main problems they have is that their guidelines are set for single chemicals, and we're not dealing with single chemicals in an environmental sample. So are these chemicals acting in additivity? Oh, good. Ugly word synergism. Uh, that's, you know, that's the question that they know they haven't gotten their guidelines. Right. The other thing is this issue of ever-increasing number of compounds that they need to regulate. In Australia, the, the, the focus of the regulators on bioanalytical tools or in vitro bioassays really came about because of the water recycling guidelines. Now, when we were, we were in the middle of a drought, uh, quite a severe one, so we needed to look at alternate water sources, and recycled water was one of those alternate water sources. There were still a lot of questions about recycled water, many compounds that we didn't really know we needed to look at. And this is where this issue of, hey, we have a technique that can allow you to, irrespective of what the compound is, can allow you to look at the biological activity in your sample, the water quality. And so instead of having to write an ever-increasing number of chemical guidelines, I mean, the water recycling guidelines are at 380-something chemicals. How much larger do we want to get, right? So the regulators have understood this, and they're very keen to find a technique, a scientifically sound, well-validated, logical technique that they can bring in and add into the risk assessment um, toolbox, so to speak, uh, to bridge that gap. And bioassays certainly are that. So we're, we're talking with our regulators. It still, still hasn't made its way into guidelines, and the reason is we still haven't figured out the, the trigger level issue. Uh, but like I said, we're getting closer. Once we've figured out the trigger level issue, I think um, certainly that will help the regulators being able to understand how, precisely how they can use these two. Once we do, once we have figured out how to get those trigger values, then the regulators can apply these tools and fill the gap that they know they have in regulation. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about in demo is trying to bridge those knowledge gaps to, to really bring those tools into wider acceptance and wider application because they certainly uh, can fill in a, a big hole that currently we're, we don't know how to deal with.